Okay. And the reason I keep coming back here is because uh, Ed makes me. Um, also because um, what I learned last time I was here was that uh, you, um, I, I'm sure you got the best uh, design program um, in the country. I'm serious, because I think most of, the, most of the schools suck, you know. Um, um, so I'm going to give you a little talk. And the, one, and the people who uh, heard me before, I'm going I'm, uh, I'm to give you a test. Okay. No, I'm not. Growing up in a loving Greek family in the Bronx, it was understood that the only son of Heralambos and Vasiliki Lois would finish high school and take over his father's flower shop. I wonder if any of you have that same problem. But my drawings at PS7 caught the eye of my eighth grade teach, art teacher, Mrs. Engel, who handed me a black string portfolio filled with drawings which she had saved and sent me to the High School of Music and Art, which happens to be, used to be, down the block. I don't know what the building is now, but it was the greatest, high, it was the greatest school of learning since Alexander sat at the feet of, of Aristotle. Um, and she sent me to the High School of Music and Art, a brilliant specialized school founded in 1936 by Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. After my first day at Music and Art, I knew that I would never be a florist. At Music and Art, I was inspired by the Bauhaus movement, which, which had ignited a modernist approach in the design world that illuminated new possibilities in two-dimensional graphics, culminating with young Paul Rand. Do they know anything about Graphic, do you know anything about history of graphic design? Not, not much. Okay, we'll see. Who, who, uh, Paul Mann was the first major art director in advertising to articulate a new graphic design freedom. At the very pinnacle of my graphic forefather stands the name of Paul Rand, cantankerous, irris, ir, irascible, loving, bristling with talent, and endowed with invincible personal conviction the invincible and badass Rand showed me my way. Rand's talent and instinct created an absolutely supreme standard for the rest of my life. We all need heroes. Mine is Paul Rand, an iconoclast who made it big in a constipated business world. When I was 15 years old, Paul Rand showed me that with talent, conviction, and courage, you can change the world. The 50s were the golden age of modernism and American graphic design. Paul Rand, Bill Golden, Lou Dorsman, Herb Lubala, and Gene Federico were known as the New York School of Design, and I was inducted by them as the enfant terrible of the, mo of the movement. I'm still the enfant terrible. <laughs> but with that strong design background, I have never regarded myself as a designer. I am a graphic communicator because I create big ideas, not designs. Surely, great graphic design is not merely the, the aesthetic arrangement of lines and shapes. Great graphic design is the formation, or is the transformation of a big idea into an, an unforgettable image. I have always understood that when an original idea springs out of a communicator's head and intuitions, the mystical blending or even juxtaposition of concept, copy and art, can lead to magic where one and one can indeed be three. When that idea is dramatized by a unique image in synergy with words that memorably communicate in a nanosecond, there is always an immediate intellectual and visceral human response. My concern has always been with creating images that catch people's eyes, penetrate their minds, warm their hearts, and cause them to act. And additionally, I've always understood that truly great graphic and verbal communication reflects and adapts to the culture, anticipates the culture, criticizes changes in the culture, and helps 
to change the culture. When you enter the field, if you instinctively feel the way, the, the way to go is against the conservative indoctrinated society and buck the trend and understand the zeitgeist of the time and indeed are mystically ahead of the culture, then and only then will you have the passion and capability to become a cultural provocateur. Abraham Lincoln said to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards of men. And in Civil Disobedience, Thoreau wrote, action from principle, the perception and performance of right, changes things in relations. It is essentially revolutionary. The best of us whose creations can be thought of as art are cultural provocateurs, infused with subversion against all kinds of authority, even God. Look to the future when you can join those of us in the creative community that are hard on big business moguls, fat cats, the authorities, courts, politicians, Wall Street greed, government that benefits the wealthy at the expense of the poor and powerless, anyone corrupted by money and power, and now a new kind of demagogic McCarthyism that attempts to frighten and blackmail our nation in an attempt to deprive affordable health care to the American people. So if you're aspiring to be a graphic designer or art director and want to create great work and succeed, not only in your profession, but in life. Your mission is not to sedate, but to awaken, to disturb, to communicate, to command, to instigate, and more importantly, to provoke. I know that in the act of creativity, being careful guarantees sameness and mediocrity, which means your work will be invisible. You can be cautious or you can be creative but there's no such thing as a cautious creative. Better to be reckless than careful, better to be bold than safe, better to have your work seen and remembered or you're struck out. There is no middle ground. But understand, a talented but meek creative personality who allows big ideas to be trampled upon can never join the pantheon of the greats because timidity and fear of the fray leads to mediocrity. The more innovative your idea, the more courageous you must be to sell it. With all the lucky breaks or unhappily a catastrophe that may befall us, I believe a person still decides their own fate, that they ordain what kind of family life they lead, what they believe in, and what kind of work they produce. Understand one thing, throughout your career, you can decide that no one ever can make you run bad work. A client can kill and kill and kill what you think is right for him, but he can't make you run bad work. Your choice is to fight back or insist that, or insist that the studio or ad agency you work for find better clients. Working hard and doing great work is as imperative as breathing. Creating great work warms the heart and enriches the soul. Those of us lucky enough to spend our days doing something we love, something we're good at, are rich. If you do not work passionately, even furiously, at being the best in the world at what you do, you fail your talent, your destiny, and your God. Look closely at my work. I'm going to show some work. Every inch of my solutions are the celebration of a big idea. No lines, no shapes, no decoration. The idea big enough placed on, on paper is perfect design. There's a story behind everything, but I can't take the time. (laughs) 
or I, I couldn't find a model. I had to shoot late at night, so I, I posed for the hand myself. <laughs> what kind of baby is Dr. Spock? Dr. Spock was the most famous doctor in the world. Yeah. That's me with a poster for Sane. Uh, that, uh, it, it, was, it was a poster against uh, nuclear testing, and uh, I was considered a uh, commie spy for, for having designed it. John, is that Billy coughing? Get up and give him some cold, Dean. Yogi Berra. The voice of the cat was Whitey Ford, his pit, the pitcher. Um, they, um, they, uh, he was called the, the uh, chairman of the board in New York. Everybody called him the chairman of the board. So I said to Yogi when he saw the commercial, I said, Yogi, do you recognize the voice? He said, no, who? I said, the chairman of the board. He, he said, what company? <laughs> the Yogiism. You don't have a cold? I don't have a cold. You have an allergy. I have an allergy. That was the first al allergy product. What this country needs is a chair you can see through, a chair that takes its place in crowded rooms. If your Harvey Chauva, uh, Prober chair wobbles, straighten your floor. There's a little matchbook cover. Boy, I'm telling you, when I come up to the big leagues, I was a shuffling, grinning, head-ducking country boy. Well, I'm still a country boy. But I know a man down at Edwards and Hanley. I'm learning. I'm learning. Edwards and Hanley, the brokers you waited for. Mickey Mantle. I just want to say one thing. Edwards and Hanley, where were you when I needed you? Edwards and Hanley, the brokers you waited for. If, if you were older, you'd understand that commercial. Joe Lewis, the most important, as important as Muhammad Ali, if that's possible. He, uh, world champion, he, uh, the most important fight in the history of the fight game was when he knocked out Joe Schmel, uh, 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 Max Schmeling. Um, it was like a fight between uh, uh, America and uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, and, uh, and, he, and he fought, uh, and, and he joined the army uh, during the war, fought many, many bouts, uh, uh, and raised money for for the uh, for the army. Uh, got out of the army, and the go and the government charged if came to him and charged him four million dollars for taxes. I mean, he was like what? And he had to, he had to work the rest of his life in Vegas, etc., to make a living. You're know, this great, great, great man. So I had him come out, do a commercial that said, "I just want to say one thing." It was in Hanley, where were you when I needed you? And when that commercial ran, everybody in America went nuts. Yeah. I did eight or nine commercials with them. I had, deal, deal is a hard, tough lot because every one of them has their own art agency. And this is a, 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 the, the, the dealer group. So, so there were 76 clients. Everybody said, you cannot make any, there was, you can't make 76 people happy. I said, want to bet? I put them all in the same commercials. But then 
for eight different songs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they love being on TV. I've heard from kids so many times saying uh, what they've learned in school is to make sure when you do advertising that you don't ask for the sale. I said, excuse me? They said, yeah, well, you, you, can't, you, know, you can't ask for the sale because it, you know, it's, like, uh, it's like you're begging. I said, excuse me? I want my maple. 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 I, I, eight fucking times I said ask for the sale. <laughs> I mean, you know, what you're doing in advertising is asking for the goddamn sale. You know, and, and, and kids today, they're embarrassed to ask for, to say, gee, that shouldn't make it look like I'm, I'm asking for something. What are you nuts? You ask for the sale and make people love watching you ask, love watching you ask. People could watch that commercial. If it came on, people used to say, hey, it's a maple commercial's on. Everyone would run into a room, you know. And their sales, actually, it was a baby cereal. And I told my client, you know, let me do a campaign that sells to older kids, too. And he said, well, how do you do it? So I got the six greatest athletes, not only in the history of those times, maybe in the history of ever, and, uh, and had them all begging, you know, crying for their maple. And their sales uh, went up 800%. 800%, you know. Uh, yeah, okay, run it. Demand your MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. MTV? MTV? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. MTV in 1982 was broadcasting for a year to nobody, literally. Not one cable operator in America wanted any part of them. The rock industry didn't want any part of them. They thought it would destroy the, the music business. The, the, everybody was nuts. So uh, they were dead in the water, and I said, I think I can save you. you know, first of all, I'll take your logo, which ain't great, and I'll put, but I'll put stuff in it, and it'll be great, you know, the, the Rolling Stone thing. Uh, they, they said, uh, you know, you can't do that. If you do that, you have to re-register the logo every time you do it. Uh, no schmucks, you know, just, just keep it. Uh, so I said to him, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do, you guys all grew up, they're, they're all 25, 26 year old uh, people. You guys all grew up with uh, uh, watching a commercial called I Want My Maple. Oh yeah, they went crazy describing that commercial you just saw. I said, well, okay, now, this is 12 years later, whatever it was, and now all you guys are 24, 25, uh, you know, 25 years old, and uh, now I'm gonna have every, all of you sons of bitches yelling, I want my, M my MTV. <laughs> and they said, well, how are you gonna do that? I said, well, I'm gonna do a commercial, quick cut commercial, blah, 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 you want my music, what do you got, voiceover? And the voiceover will say at one point, if you don't get MTV where you live, pick up the phone, dial your local cable operator and say, and at that point I'm gonna have Mick Jagger pick up the phone and say, I want my MTV. And they all looked at me. And Bob Pittman, the head, the head guy, who was 27, said, uh, George, uh, you, you don't understand. Uh, you couldn't get a, a, a cable, uh, you couldn't get a rock star for, for any kind of money. They don't want any part of MTV. It's, you're dead in the water. Uh, could you go back and do something else? So I walked back to the agency. I said, I'm going to get fucking Mick Jagger, you know. <laughs> and I called, uh, I called um, um, uh, 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 Bill Graham. Gee, I forgot his name. I called the great Bill, Bill Graham. He was uh, uh, the best, uh, most important uh, rock promoter in the country. And I, I had worked with him with uh, uh, Bob Dylan to, uh, getting Ruben Hurricane, uh, Hurricane caught out of jail. Anyway, I called him up and I said, uh, I told him the story and he said, George, uh, MT would destroy the rock music. I said, oh, no, 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 no you're, you're stupid too. He said, oh, okay, 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 what do you want? I want the phone number of uh, Mick Jagger. He said, okay. 
He gave, he gave me the phone, but don't tell him you gave him the phone. I call up Mick Jagger in London, and I get him. It was like 10 o'clock at night, it was 5 o'clock in New York. And it's him. And I'm talking, you're there, Mick. You're there, Mick. Finally, after 15 minutes, I said, what do you think, Mick? He said, I'll be in New York on Monday. He comes to New York on Monday, and not only does he come, but he brings Peter Townsend and uh, uh, Pat Benatar with him, produced the commercials that day. We, a couple of days later, when I put together, when I finished the spots, I put it, we ran three or four spots in San Francisco, like 10 o'clock at night, 11, 12, maybe one in the morning. And 5.30 in the morning, which is 8.30 in New York, the cable operator calls from Ke San Francisco and says, it gets Bob Pittman on the phone. He said, Pittman, get that fucking commercial off the air. They said, I'll take it off right away. He said, oh, listen, uh, Pittman, uh, by the way, I'll take it. He said, what are, you, what, what are you gonna take? He said, MTV. He said, why? He said, because I'm getting thousands of phone calls. And what happened is we ran three or four spots in every market in America, and six and four, four months later, MTV was the biggest thing to ever hit television. I was doing a campaign for Olivetti, and I, and uh, it was they were selling Olivetti typewriters like gangbusters. And I get a phone call from my client. He said, "George, uh, Italian uh, guy. He said, George, hey, George, Giorgio. Uh, there's a uh, there's a woman downstairs at some place, some an organization called Now National National Organization of Women. And uh, there's some, they're picketing me. What am I going to do? So I run over there." And it's, uh, you know, Gloria Steiner, I mean, the, the, the Steiner, and the whole bunch of them, you know, you know, all great women, but I mean, they're picketing my fucking commercial anyway. Uh, uh, and uh, I said, what's, what's wrong, ladies? He said, uh, well, uh, you only show, when you show secretaries, you only show women. And I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, you mean you want me to show do a commercial with a male secretary and a female boss. They said, right, you're not that stupid as you look, Lois, right. <laughs> so I said, I promise you I will do a commercial that way. Just leave my client alone. And they all left and you know, three weeks later I called them up to watch that commercial. They sat in my office to watch that commercial and they walked out and they were spitting mad. You know? And I said, what? so what else is new? The boss, doesn't the boss always try to make the secretary? And I used Joe Namath, the great Joe Namath, because he could type, also because he was famous, you know. Okay. Uh, well, that's true. I've, just, I've seen that happen. <laughs> Can you imagine a client today running that? Of course, remember, there's an inherent beauty in soup cans that Michelangelo could not have imagined existed. Fugitive Andy Warhol and Gabby Sunny Liston yeah. always fly planet. They like our girls, they like our food, they like our style, and they like to be on time. Thanks for flying Granite, fellas. When you got it, flaunt it. <laughs> Warhol loved my commercials. He loved everything I did. He loved my escort. He loved everything I ever did. And I called him up and I told him I'm going to put him on TV. I told him I'm going on TV. And I thought, oh, good. Um, and, uh, and I tell him what to do. I give him the lines about tomato cans, et cetera, et cetera. 
Sonny Liston, you didn't have, you didn't have to uh, uh, direct because he didn't know who the fuck Andy Hall was, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, every, and so, we, okay, we're going to shoot it. And at a certain point, Andy had to stay, blah, 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 blah. When you got it, flaunt it. And he, he did it. When you got it, flaunt it. I said, Andy, I can't hear it. Much louder. Next take. When you got it, flaunt it. Next take. When you got it, flaunt it. It got lower and lower. Uh, you know, did about 20 takes, and I'm walking around the studio, and you know, when you're shooting a commercial, and it's not going right, everybody in the, stu in the studio is going, holy shit, what's Lois going to do? So finally, he did another one. When you got it, flaunt it. I said, got great, perfect, terrific. And he left. Everybody said, you don't have it. I said, no, no, no. Hey, I, my, I got a great uh, gay pal, Frank Garrick. I'll have him dub it. <laughs> I called Frank Garrick. I said, Frank, just say it the way you say it. When you got it, flaunt it. <laughs> Andy begged me to send him all the commercials, because you have she sat and he watched me shoot the, all the commercials. And I sent it, send them all to him, and, and uh, he calls me up and he said, oh, it, Everybody in the factory is so excited. Everything's so terrific. Oh, they're wonderful. You know, I love the Dali commercial. I love this commercial. I love that commercial. I love this one. But you know what, George? I said when you got it flaunted better than anybody. <laughs> it was dumb, got it. There's a, there's a poster for the New York Vets in Ed's office with him acting like a fool in it, right? <laughs> This is an ad that ran in the New York Times, uh, and, and, and New York went nuts when they saw this ad on page two. An ad this big from a, a man convicted unjustly, but convicted and for three, uh, and he's in, uh, convict, uh, and, and sentenced to 300 years in jail. Ruben Hurricane Card. This is one of the. Uh, one of the, uh, there's, there's Muhammad and uh, with the, um, uh, Ellen Gersten, of course. Uh, there, there I am back there, and that's, there's my honey. You see the blonde? <laughs> married, how, how many years am I married? 63. To the same woman. <laughs> That ad made Tommy Hilfiger famous. It ran, um, actually it was a, 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 a telephone kiosk poster. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, for a good event, Ralph Lauren, Perry Ellis, t t t Calvin Klein, no, no. Tommy's mother didn't know that was him. <laughs> and uh, the posters were up and I called uh, page six, the guys at page six I know, and I said, could I know the posters were going up? And I said, uh, hey, have you guys seen a poster that was going up this morning? Uh, and I started to describe it. They said, yeah, who the fuck is TH? <laughs> you got a whole office is going crazy. We're all on our phones. We're all trying to find who TH is. So I told them who it was. The next day they ran a, a, you know, a, a, a almost half a page in, 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 the po in the post that said, who the hell is T dash 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 dash? The New York Times saw it. They ran a full page story the next day. Is Tommy Hilfiger successful because of his, of his product or his advertising? Tommy's store was only open two days. You know, uh, a, a, a couple of days later, he was on a Johnny Carson show, and he became Tommy Hilfiger. You know.
Before those commercials, um, ESPN was considered a Mickey Mouse a sports network. You know, uh, not involved in real sports. Uh, you know, uh, a demolition derby uh, a, 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 a network. The, the commercials ran, they, did a, a, they researched something and they found out after three, running for three weeks that ESPN was rated way above ABC, CBS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you're looking at is not successful campaigns, you're looking at miracle campaigns, campaigns where, where businesses were dead and like Tommy un, Unknown, this guy, ESPN dead. You can do, you can create advertising that absolutely is miraculous and most bad agencies don't have a clue because they've never done it. USA Today could not last any longer because they were, only, they, were, they were selling the paper, but they were averaging less than two pages a day in advertising. The agency wouldn't touch them, would not touch them. I ran, this camp, I ran a campaign, and a week later, they were averaging 25 pages a day. Uh, that, and that's like just making things happen in a, like that, fast. Um, that uh, Kasparov saw this poster and he said, no, no, na zdrovie tovarish. Kasparov is the greatest chess player that ever lived. Na zdrovie tovarish. Karpov and Kasparov, nose to nose, and between them, a white queen. See the white queen? Okay. That is actually the voice of God.
to travel.com or your favorite health and beauty store to get the one and only travel. Uh, uh, these are the Esquire covers from the 60s. Merry Christmas of the 100th GI killed in Vietnam. 100th. Uh, when when uh, Cassius Clay saw this, he said to me, hey, George, that's the last black motherfucker America wants to see coming down their chimney. <laughs> But this, this is Sonny Liston, he was a killer. No, literally a killer, you know. I mean, he was a bad, badass. This is a year after the president was assassinated. Uh, I, we, we felt feminism coming on, so I dotted the I. This is evident. Uh, Ed Sullivan, uh, he was the, the man who introduced the Beatles to America. So I'm watching him on Sunday, and he's introducing the Beatles to America, and America's going apeshit. And I, uh, the next day I went to him and uh, got him to pose in a Beatles wig. Uh, a lot of these covers really infuriated America. Uh, it's uh, Bob Dylan, uh, Malcolm X, uh, uh, Castro and Kennedy as the four most important uh, people to uh, 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 college students. Um, again, very early in the war, oh, uh, 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 senators uh, everywhere went crazy when they saw this. They said, "How can Esquire magazine say that American boys, you know, were you know, uh, killing some people?" I said, "Excuse me." Are you kidding? We committed jo genocide in, in Korea. I know. I was one of the soldiers. We committed genocide in, in Vietnam, and we com and we commit, you know, and uh, and uh, yeah, because you put young men in harm's way, and they shoot anything that fucking moves. He's watching uh, Ruby kill uh, uh, Oswald uh, live on television. That's my home. This, this cover, um, it, it really has a, an iconic status, but it, it's, it basically it's, it's a combination of, of the Vietnam War, race, religion, um, and, uh, and uh, what I missed something else. Anyway. Uh, it, um, when I was when he was posing for me, I, uh, I uh, you understand he was out of. They had taken away his championship. He was no longer fighting. He was waiting for the Supreme Court to decide when he was going to go to jail, and um, and he was walk, going around the country talking to college groups, get, getting them pissed off, and, and, and working up the uh, anti-war movement. Um, so uh, he's standing there and he said, hey, hey, he's posing. He said, "Hey George," I said, "What?" Hey George, and, you know, what do you want? Hey, George, Muhammad, just pose. Hey George, which means he wanted to talk to me. And he looked at me, pointed to each arrow, and he said, General Westmoreland, Lyndon Johnson. And he, point, and he pointed he, the, to the people in America that were trying to crucify him. Uh, it's hard to understand. Uh, if, if Nixon lost an election to Jack Kennedy because he looked evil on television, which he was, <laughs> and, uh, and he had a five o'clock shadow. And this was the, the, the editor, the great editor of Esquire said, hey, George, you won't believe this, but that Nixon's going to run again. So I found a picture of him sleeping, and I had him getting, being made up. His uh, pest secretary called up and said, you commie sons of bitches, you left wing sons of bitches. I said, what, what's the matter? It's funny. I mean, it's a warrior. He said, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to say that, that he's, a, he, that he's a, a, a homosexual. <laughs> uh, this, I did this cover a couple of a month after uh, Robert Kennedy uh, was assassinated. Of course, Jack in 62 
Dr. King in 68 and a couple of months after that, Robert Kennedy. I did Robert Kennedy's uh, Senate, uh, advertising for Senate campaign in 64 when he, uh, in, New, in uh, the state of New York. I said, I, I call him Andy, I'm gonna, put you, I'm gonna put you on a cover of Esquire. He said, he's on the phone, oh, George Lewis is gonna put me on a cover of Esquire. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, George. I know you, what's the idea? I said, Andy, I'm gonna put you in a, I'm gonna have you drowning in a giant can of Campbell's soup. And he said, oh, I love it, but won't you have to build a gigantic can? I said, schmuck, no, okay. <laughs> After this ran, I, you know, it was a real outcry and I really had to apologize for it. I didn't apologize to the cops, I apologized to the pigs. <laughs> Oh, this I had to kind of apologize to Cardinal Cook, um, who, when he, uh, the Archdiocese, uh, the Catholic Archdiocese, St. Patrick at St. Pay, he called me over and uh, chewed me out. Uh, and uh, um, I, uh, I got away with it because uh, I told him my wife used to be Catholic, but um, she agrees with me. But anyway. Um, this is a killer cover because uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, uh, you know, men, uh, you know, in harm's way killed, but this guy was a psychopath, uh, Lieutenant Kelly, and um, he was responsible for 500, the killing of 500 uh, um, old men, women, and children at a place called My Lai. And um, uh, there was an excerpt of a book that was written about him in a, in a magazine. So I asked the, the, the author to try to get him to come to the shoot. I told him what I wanted, and he, but he said, George, he'll, uh, he'll come, but he will not do it. He will not pose with Vietnamese children that he killed, that he killed. And I said, well, can he bring him anyway? So he came and I talked to him and I talked to him and I bullshitted him. And finally I get him to pose and it was a very solemn shoot, and he was very solemn about it. Basically, he was, his, he was acting as if he was saying, look, I'm not a killer, I love children. And then finally, at the end of the shoot, I said, I said uh, his nickname was Rusty, I said, Rusty, just great. Now give me one with a shitty grin. And he did, and that's the money shot. Uh, Norman Mail, uh, it's hard to explain this. Well, Norman Mail and Jermaine Greer, it, 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 when feminism was at its height and they were having screaming battles, Norman uh, 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 Mail, it was a male, male chauvinist. And, and uh, anyway, so there was a, 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 an issue with old King Kong photographs, et cetera. So I have uh, a, 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 a Mailer, um, uh, uh, you know, with Jermaine Greer, with Jermaine Greer looking like she, she wanted to stop him. And, um, and uh, he called up uh, the, the, the editor and he said, hey, hey, you son of a bitch. And he challenged it to a fight. <laughs> Mela was crazy. A great writer, but he's crazy. And he said, no, 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 look, I know, you know, everybody knows that George Lois left the covers. Here's his phone number, call him. Mela, uh, you know, Hayes calls me up and he says, I think Mail is gonna call you any minute. He did, and we, he was screaming at me, challenged me to a fight, so we arranged to meet each other in the, at Central Park at eight o'clock in the morning, and uh, he still hasn't shown up. <laughs> oh, well, doesn't it, one of my points, and one of my points in the Damn Good Advice book is what's going on with the, can't, can't people speak without saying, um, I mean, like, and you fucking know? <laughs> it's impossible, and it's not just all of you, I'm sure. It's everybody, I mean, especially the bright, bright people on television. You know, uh, people, uh, you know, real, uh, uh, real minds get, get up there, and I sit there, and I wait for them to do it, and whenever they say, you know, I repeat it, you know. When my wife hears me in the other room, she hears me going, you know, you know, because I'm saying you know louder than the person. You know, you know. 
amazing. And, and, and really, honest to God, w one of the things I talk about is learning how to sell your work. You know, I mean, I, the, the classes that I've been to, like the Steve Hellis classes at SVA, I make the kids get up and do a five minute pitch and to explain what they're showing, what they're gonna show me or what they are showing me. And if they say you know or um or something, I say sit the fuck down. <laughs> really, you gotta learn how it, let's start a whole new thing and, and get rid of that. Okay. Um, anyway, um, let me just end up. In a profession that should have no rules, I have damn good advice for all to heed for your work at CCNY and throughout your careers. Always go for the big idea that sears the virtues of a product in a viewer's mind, brain and mind, resulting in a sales explosion. In creating advertising, the word comes first, then the visual. You got that? Everybody said, no, but you're so, you're so great at Im creating images. Why can't you do that backwards? I said, no, you gotta do it with the first. You want a mnemonic with the words, and then a mnemonic with a, with a, with a, with something visually happens with it, and then you got two mnemonics. Um, um, don't expect a creative idea to pop out of your computer. Why do you stare into the fucking computer when you're working? And I go up to people and say, what do you got? What are you doing? What's the idea? Well, no, I'm, 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 I'm fishing. There's nothing in there. There's nothing to look at. Um, um, you can never learn anything from a mistake. A failure is supposed to give you pause, shake you up, humble you, but that immediately ends your career as a fearless creative thinker. When I say this, people in business go crazy. I mean, that's what the world's about. That's what business is about. You make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes. No, no. How can you learn from your mistakes? If you come up with an interesting, exciting idea and, it, and somehow it fails, from then on you do shit advertising. You can't learn. So when people say to me, I, I think, I, I gave lectures and sometimes they, then before me people talked about their mistakes. I get up and say, I never made a mistake in my life. Why? Because if, if I make a mistake or something doesn't go wrong, it didn't fucking happen. But otherwise, otherwise you turn into a dead thinker. You turn into whatever, into everybody else. Um, never listen to music when you're trying to come up with a big idea. I watch kids sitting there and they listen to music. Teamwork might work in building an Amish barn, <laughs> but it can't create a big idea. Four, five, or six people together talk, don't, don't create anything. In fact, the smarter the group is, the more trouble you're in. You gotta defend on yourself or, and or working with a writer, you know, if you're a copywriter or an author. Two people, maybe three, can create, can create great work. But uh, four, forget about it. Um, if it's a rush job, don't say no, say now. When you get into the, 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 people always love to say, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. God damn it, you can do anything. You know, bam, you can do it fast. A brilliant idea won't sell itself. If all else fails, it's better to commit suicide. <laughs> Which I did once. It's, probably, it's in the, like, I literally, Looked like I was going to commit suicide. You read about. Uh, tell the devil, devil's advocate in the room to go to hell, because there's always one in the room. If you truly, if you create truly great advertising, you can go far above and beyond the wild expectations of your client. I, I have always gone so far past what my client thinks could happen. It isn't funny. They, they can't believe it when I do it, and, and when I, they just can't believe it. But that. But you can't sit there and get you know, account guys and, uh, and writers uh, uh, come to you with a piece of paper with a strategy and you follow that strategy. You can't do that because you gotta do it out of your own head. Um, uh, oh, oh, this is interesting. The only thing that gets better when it gets bigger is a penis. <laughs> 
I'm talking about the eight acre season, they, they, you know, they, they, if a good one comes along, the, the big ones buy them, and before you know it, there's only like five or six big agencies in the world that own everything, and they all, they, you know, they all suck. Um, never ever work for bad people. Uh, I mean, I've thrown bad people out of my agency, believe me. Uh, to keep the big boys honest, speak truth to power. If you think people are dumb, you'll spend a lifetime doing dumb work. You gotta understand that most data agencies think people are dumb. You know, they do, they do research, they, do, they create work, and then they test it to make sure people understand it. You know? and so they, they're catering to, to, to dumb down America. So if you think people are dumb, you're gonna do dumb work. If you think people are smart, you can do, you're going for sharp work. Any great creative idea should stun momentarily. Anything I've ever done, if I show it to somebody and the client, if the client doesn't go, what the fuck is that? I'm in trouble. It means I, I'm, I'm giving them something that they, would, they expected. If you show a client something that they expected, you got nothing. Um, uh, uh, the things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. No, the world is not 5,000 years old, fellas, okay? Um, um, Dying isn't important. It's what you do before you die that's important. Extol your mentors. The lesson which most data agencies have never understood, which I said before, is the great, that great advertising can, can perform marketing miracles. One of the last things is um, I never eat shit. People say sometimes, well, how do you know you eat shit? I said, well, if it looks like shit and it smells like shit, it tastes like shit. It's shit. <laughs> Throughout your career, be thrilled that you're doing work that you love and getting a paycheck for it. And finally, I'm back to reject group growth. Reject getting together in bunches and think, think, thinking things through. That's bullshit. Two, reject analysis paralysis. Three, to produce truly masterful work, reject con and create icon. That's it. Thank you. We, we got time? We got time? Yeah, yeah. We have time to ask questions. I hope you have some questions to ask. George says a lot of things that I hope I'm making you think, whatever. Also, once we finish the question period, George's book is available in my office, and George will be here to sign it, should you, you know, you can buy it. It's a great deal, so after the session here, you can just come down. To what is it, like, is it like $10 or something? Yeah, it's like $10. It no, really, I, I made sure, I, I did a book, I, I, I made sure that it would be $10. So instead of a, you know, a, a shit, you know, a, a Big Mac, you know, and a, and a Coke that's gonna, that kills you, you know, you get a book that you can look at. I wish that, I mean, every young person, everybody should read my book, because I got it all there in, in one $10 book, you know, I swear to God. So the floor is open. To questions? Ow. Yes? All right, my first question is, do you um, believe that um, research is the enemy of creativity? That what is? Research is the enemy oh, of creativity. Oh, almost always, sure. Oh, sure. Uh, although I've used research uh, to good ends, um, I was, um, I had an account uh, in Chicago, uh, it was um, um, a Quaker Oats, uh, a big giant company. And one of their products was uh, Aunt Jemima. Uh, and, uh, pancake mix. Huh? Pancake mix. Uh, yeah, a pancake mix. And I, uh, and I said to the head guy, I said, uh, you guys don't have a syrup for some reason. It wasn't my account. And he said, uh, no. So I don't get it. Why not? He said, we're not in a syrup business. And I went, a couple of months later, I was back there for something. I said, uh, why don't you syrup? He said, George, stop talking about syrup. 
So I went back to the agency and I got account guys like Ed and I said, uh, let's figure out, uh, talk to somebody there who knows about pancake, let's figure out a little piece of research that they do for pancake mix, you know, and, uh, and so that they're real good questions and, uh, and there were 10 questions about pancake, blah, 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 blah. And the, but the last question should say, should, should list eight, I think it was, pan, uh, syrups, pancake syrups, and one of them should say, Aunt Jemima syrup, and find out for people which of the eight they bought that year. And we, the guys went out and did the research, they did 100 people, and 82 people of the 100 said they had bought Aunt Jemima syrup that year. So I went back to the client and I said, here, schmucks. People think they're buying the Aunt Jemima syrup. Fucking come out with Aunt Jemima syrup. <laughs> anyway, they did, and the young guy that had helped us with the research out there at, at uh, Quaker Rose uh, became, eight years later, the chairman of the board. And they all talked about how he had the genius to create Aunt Jemima motherfucking syrup, you know. Uh, no, I mean, syrup, the ant, uh, it can't help me in any way, shape, or form. The only, in, the only research that I, yeah, I do my own research, you know, if I want to find out about something, I talk to people, I talk to them, whatever. But the only research that I really enjoyed in the old days is this, there was something called starch. They took, they took a magazine and there was research where they had people turn the pages through the All of Life magazine, and then maybe 10 minutes later, they would talk to them and say, oh, by the way, um, could you tell us what, mag what, what ads you remembered in the, in the Life magazine we showed you five minutes ago? And most of the time, it's like, oh. Uh, and anyway, we used to come in with like 92% of the people that saw the magazines saw the ads that we had in there. I love that advertising, because that said, they looked at the at an ad and it bowled them over and it made them remember it. What you got to do is memorable advertising. That's what it's all about. You got to do famous advertising. All the advertising I do is becomes famous. Boom. If it's television, Johnny Carson, was, who had the big talk show back then, Johnny Carson would pick up the lines and say, say, them, say them out of context. You know, there was a that one with uh, uh, Mickey Mantle saying uh, for the, for the, uh, for the uh, stock bloke, he said, I first come up to the big leagues, uh, shuffling head duck and shit eating country boy. Now, no man now that was a hammy. I'm learning, I'm learning. Johnny Carson picked up, I'm learning, I'm learning. Out of context, people would say something, he'd say, oh, I'm learning, I'm learning. And then he would, uh, then he, the, the one of Joe, Joe Lewis, he said, uh, he said, where were you when I needed you? He was picking that line up, and then there was, a, there was four or five other com commercials in that campaign, and he picked them up, almost all of them. And they, he was, they, they were getting letters from people, they, uh, Carson told, they were getting letters from people saying, what, it sounds like you're speaking about that from someplace. And they realized the, the commercials I was running were, was only running in New York. It was a New York campaign. And he has a national campaign, so he's, so one day he comes on and he said, gee, I did, we just found out, I'm talking blah, 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 and they played all of our commercials. Holy shit, you know, uh, but that's what, uh, you know, that, so, you know, I always say, one of my big points is advertising that you do should have built-in PR possibilities. It, and it's not PR where you have to pick up the phone, maybe, but PR where it becomes part of the language. You know, when you got it flaunted, that campaign for, uh, for, um, for Braniff was, uh, I mean, uh, you couldn't get away from it. When you got it flaunted, you still, uh, I want my MTV, uh, MTV. I mean, I, 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 you got to do advertising that's famous. Uh, I, I, somebody once said to me, uh, uh, you, uh, when I was at Doyle Dane Burnback, working for Bill Burnback, somebody said, uh, 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 and what do you do? You know, I, I do the media. I, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, 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 what do you do, uh, George? And I had just presented the whole campaign, so it was like a joke. And I said, I make one million dollars look like ten million dollars, and I mean it, because everybody makes ten million dollars look like nothing. 
I don't mean one, not nothing. You can mention, you can say the name of a big a company that spends 200, you can dig out re research and find out 200 of the biggest companies in America that spend over $200 million, 50, 60, 100 million in advertising. And you can say the name of the brand, okay, tell, give me a feel, what, what, does, the, what does the advertising campaign say? There's four, $200 million coming at you. And they say, uh, I don't know. They can't tell you what the advertising is in any way, shape, or form. If somebody says, uh, what's MTV? I want my motherfucking MTV. You know what I mean? I mean, that, you know, um, it's, you gotta do famous advertising, famous. And famous advertising, usually, you, you talk, like to put the name of the product in it, you know? I want my MTV. No, no, uh, I, uh, uh, Harold Hayes, the, uh, the, the great editor, I mean, he really has a reputation of, uh, of being the best, the greatest uh, editor in, America, in, in American magazine history. He, uh, he was in a playoff with two other guys as, for the head editorship for, for three years, for two years, with Clay Felker and with Ralph Ginsburg. And they were like a triumvirate, three guys at editors. I'm, I'm, I, I, I said to the publisher, was it, how, what, how, how, that's crazy. He said, well, there are three great guys, I didn't know what to do. So I figured they'll kill each other, they'll kill each other off, there'll be one left standing anyway. So the day he was left standing, he calls me up, I, I, I didn't know who he was, and he had been reading about me because I had started my, I, I had left Oil Day and burned back in the, the first week of 1960, and I started the second creative agency in the world, Patrick King Lewis. And it was the first aid agency ever to have a, the name of an art director in it, because art directors weren't important. Art directors sat in the room with their thumbs up their ass waiting for people, well, copywriters, to bring up a copy and say, do a layout. Copy, co art directors were a joke, you know? They had no part of, 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 the, of, the con of, of creating uh, anything to do with the concept. So, um, um, uh, where the hell was I? What am I talking about? That's the way you started Esquire. So, Harold calls me up that day, can we have lunch? I thought he was looking for me to, uh, I, like I was a media guy, but I said, okay, because I, I was reading the magazine, because, and he said, a, 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 a southerner, oh, that's scary, you know, with southern accent, shit. You know, I, I was in the army during the Jim Crow South. You know, no motherfucking, any, any white guy with a sudden accent scares me, you know. Um, and anyway, he said, uh, I wonder, pal, if you can help me figure out how to do better, es better Esquire colors, better colors. Yeah, well, how do you do them now? Well, you know, we, we, everybody works on the, everybody there works on the, on the issue, and towards the end of the month, we all get together, you know, four, uh, four writers, four this, four that, so you know, the, 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 the art director, the artist, blah, blah. and we decide, we spend time deciding which article we should make a cover about. I said, yeah. And then we all go, go away, we all come back uh, three days later with ideas on the co for covers. And we choose two or three of them. And we, comp and we make a comp of them. And I said, holy shit, group fucking grope. The first time I ever said group grope I was then. And he said, what do you mean? I said, is that the way you work with the gay Talese? You, 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 know, you, you, you sit there and you say, uh, let's, uh, let's have a, a discussion. What to he said, no. So obviously nobody there knows how to do covers, otherwise somebody would come up to you and say, here's your cover. So you gotta go out and try and get somebody. What do you mean get somebody? Well, you gotta get a graphic designer, a guy who understands the culture, a guy who, who's, liter who's, who's literate, a guy who, uh, who uh, loves movies, a guy who loves politics. <laughs> yeah, and he said, well, who? And I started to give him names. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You gotta do me a favor, you gotta do me one cover, because I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I said, okay, I'll do your cover. Uh, it was on a Thursday, and he said, uh, I said, when's your next cover due? He said, well, on Tuesday, but I'll give you the one for now. No, no, tell me the one that's coming, this is due Tuesday. He said, really? I said, well, let me go back to the office and get my stuff. Come. 
I said, no, no, just talk there. Tell me what the story, come on, you know what it, and he starts telling me this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and then very, he, oh, oh yeah, also we have a spread where there's a photo of uh, Floyd Patterson, the world champion, and uh, he's about to fight, uh, you know, to give a fight to uh, Sonny Liston, um, you know, and, uh, and, and I knew that Floyd uh, was a 10 to 1, 9 to 1 favorite. And he we went over very quickly. I knew what to do immediately. I knew I was, so I went back, I called, I called the photographer. I said, um, Harold, uh, uh, Harold Krieger, I said, um, uh, get me a guy who was built like Floyd Patterson, uh, like six foot, uh, not too, uh, not too much, uh, let's go to St. Vincent, uh, Saint, not St. Vincent, St. Nicholas Arena, which is, uh, because there's no columns, and we're going to take a photograph of Floyd seemingly laying there dead, left for dead, Nick, Nick Liston killed him, and everybody in the, left him, or, a, metaphor, or a metaphor for, for a loser, took the picture, Sent it, sent it to Harold on Tuesday morning. I get a call, he said, I never saw a cover like this in my life. I said, no shit. <laughs> he said, you're calling the fight? I said, yeah. But not the way every sports writer's calling it. You're calling it the other way. I said, yeah. Because I know, I know Floyd's gonna get destroyed. He said, you're crazy. I said, you're crazy because he's gonna run it. Because you know what? You got a 50-50 chance I'm right. That, that's a funny line. Um, anyway, it, it ran, and it, it was lambasted. I mean, there was three or four days there that people who worked there said to me years later, they thought that, that it was the end of Esquire. Everybody's out there lambasting you, right? You know, how stupid, you know, men's mind, blah, blah, blah. And anyway, three to four days later, the fight comes on. I'm sitting in my living room and uh, waiting for the fight to come on TV. And um, my, my wife comes in and she says, why are, why are you so nervous, hot shot? I said, I'm not nervous about the fight. I'm nervous about the color of the trunks. What had happened, and I told Harold, when he said, OK, we're going to run it, I said, Harold, hold it. We've got to decide the color of the trunks. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the champ decides the color of trunks, he could either back there black or white. And, um, and uh, we have to decide, I called Customato, I, custody, I called his, his handler, and I asked him what Floyd's gonna wear, and he said, why, why are your skin? Anyway, so we gotta decide. He said, what are we gonna do? He said, I said, you got a cord in your pocket? And we're on the phone. He said, yeah, flip it. Heads it's, heads it's black, tail this white. He said, you're crazy. I said, just flip the fucking coin. He flipped the coin. He said, head. He said, black. OK, he's going to wear it. He's wearing black trunks. So we show him but wearing black trunks. So I said to my wife that night, I'm not nervous about the fight. I'm nervous about the color of the trunks. She said, whoa, this is interesting, right? And I'm waiting for the, 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 the listening kids in, into, into the ring first, then the champ gets in. And, and, they're different, and I'm just sitting there waiting for it. And he, and he, they take off his, his robe and he's wearing white trunks, which means my guy is wearing black trunks, right? Anyway, so I did that and they, everybody went crazy now. Whoa, what a, they, 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 Esquire were geniuses, blah, blah, blah. So Harold said, you gotta keep doing my covers. So I did the covers for the next 10 fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> How do I advertise myself? Well, this isn't bad right here. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about myself, but what I'm doing is teaching, motherfucker. You know, I'm teaching. I mean, I'm, I'm really teaching. You know, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, what is it? When you're starting out, when you're just beginning, how do you, how do you get? Well, I, you know, I, One of the th one of the questions, maybe it's not the, 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 I'm not answering right. Correctly. One of the things I have in my book is when you get a job, because a lot of people get jobs and disappear. You know, is I make your presence felt, right? 
So I, I remember when I was writing it, I was sitting there saying, well, how did I do it my, when I was gone? Oh yeah, uh, I, my, 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 uh, I had a great teacher my second year at Pratt, because the first year was terrible. And he said, what are you doing in school? And I said, I'm, I, I, I want to get a job because I, I don't want to be a flowerist. He said, ah, and he, sent, and he sent me to a woman by the name of Reba Associates, and I get this job. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm out of school. I got my first job, and she was a great, great woman. And uh, I show up that morning, and I didn't think about it twice. I bought a, a sleeping bag with me, you know, a, a sleeping roll. And, she, and I walk in, she said, what are you, what's that? I said, a sleeping roll. I said, why? Well, I'm gonna need it when I have to spend nights you know, getting, getting jobs done. She said, I, I, I can see her saying, holy shit, what do I have here? <laughs> right? I, then and I, I remember going through what I did in my first days. Uh, when, I worked, when I got back from Korea in 52, uh, I worked for Bill Gold at a CBS television. I mean, this was, that's the job I wanted. And uh, he, uh, and I do a job, and I, first day, uh, uh, first ad for a, a, a thing called, a show called Gunsmoke, very famous. And, uh, and I go up to his secretary, it's a very big room, it's a dark room, and his secretary there, and I said, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to see Mr. Golden, that was my first, and she, and she went like this, she went, it was like, huh? Like she was saying, like, take a shot at him. And I walked in, and, I, and he's in the middle of the room. He's working on a on a small joint table. Uh, you always wore, wore a suit. A good-looking man, looked like Gary Cooper. And he's sitting there. And I go up. To, <laughs> I got the ad. And I'm standing there. <clears throat> I turn and I look at her, and she's going like this. He's, he's fucking playing me, you know. He, I mean, he, there's a Webster dictionary on her desk. I walk to the dictionary, walk tw you know, 20 feet, pick up the dictionary, come back, stand over Bill, who was drawing, put my hands up like this, drop the book. Oh. Boom! He goes, ah! I said, oh, George, what can I do for you? Uh, well, Bill, I have a something, gun smoke, blah, 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 blah. He shows, looks at it, he goes, boy, that's terrific. That's terrific, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call the West Coast and have them change the title to, to, to this. Thanks, thanks a lot. I picked up the book, went back, put it down, walked into work, right, okay? The next morning, I get a phone call from his wife, a great, great woman by the name of C.P. Pinellas. And I knew who she was, obviously. She was the first per woman in the Art Victors Hall of Fame. And she calls up and she says, George, my name is C.P. Pinellas. I don't think you know if you know who I am. I said, of course I know who you are. Uh, she said, well, I just wanted to call you to, to say, uh, today, th thank you for not taking any of Bill's shit. <laughs> so he went home and told his wife, I got some fucking kid. He, he, he does the whole thing with the Webster Dictionary, and then he shows me a, a job and a half. You know what I mean? I mean, everybody at CBS found out about me, you know what I mean? I mean, I, when I went to Doyle Dane, uh, I walked in, I, 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 I went in on a, on a Friday, and they showed me my room, and it looked like shit. And I came in on a Saturday with paint. I walked into the building with paint, and walked into the elevator, went up, painted my fucking room, brought my own furniture in, saw a requisition for, for a job for that, carried with the big ear, saw that they did the ads on the weekend, came in, in the, on a, the Monday morning. Bill Burnback came in at six, 9 o'clock in the morning to say hello to me, and he said, boy, they really fixed you up. What a, what a beautiful room. I said, well, no, I painted over the weekend. He said, huh? <laughs> yeah, but look at the furniture. No, I bought the furniture in the center. <laughs> what are those ads? I said, well, I did them uh, on, you know, over the weekend. Wow, these are great ads. Oh, my God. Uh, who wrote them with you? I said, I don't need a writer, I don't need a writer. He said, I'll be a writer. And he walked out stunned, okay? All I know is I, I, I traced back what I had done and I, I never planned it. It was like sitting there and saying, oh, just you know, instinctively, you're gonna fucking make people know who the fuck you are. But you can't get away with it unless the work's great.
If the work's, if the work's not great, <laughs> you're a jerk. <laughs> if, the work's, if the work's not great, the, dropping the book makes you a, an asshole. Last question. Go ahead. Say it again, say it again. Most in, in the one year you were at Pratt, what was the most valuable thing you learned? If I, if I, at Pratt? Uh, I, you got to understand, I went to, I came from the high school of music and art, this place I told you about across the street. Uh, you, you can't, I can't tell you the education I got for the time I was 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, I'm in my second, I'm in my uh, first term I was, I was 14, probably 14, almost 15. And uh, it, it was the first design classes I ever took, you know, because I do, 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 do. And, uh, and uh, you know, the teacher said, you know, the professor said, uh, okay, we're going to do this Bauhaus and stuff. Uh, we're going to do a design of circles. And everybody sits there and then they cut out circles. I do a design of circles. 18 by 24 sheet. And then, okay, now today, uh, circles and squares together. And now we're going to do, so what happens, you, what you, you were doing was kind of ripping off uh, Paul Clay, Malevich, uh, Mondrian, uh, uh, Herbert Bayer. You were ripping off the, the, the people who have been, uh, you know, experimenting with visual, with visual shapes, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's uh, interesting. It's not an idea, but it was interesting. I mean, if you, but, but in the kind of a designer, you, I like mine better than the other guys. Um, and at the end of that term, I, he says, uh, all right, class, today we're going to, what we do today is, is going to be one half of your mark for the year, for the term. What we do today. We don't have a lot of time because I know you people are having to go to class. We're, I want to really thank George for coming, and I hope you all had a great time. We'd have food and the book for sale, and I just want to thank you. Right. I want to finish the story. Yeah. Finish. So, I, so anyway, it's rect rectangles. So I sat there, and everybody's working on rectangles, and they're doing this and this and this, and I'm sitting there, and I didn't move a fucking inch. 18 by 24 sheet of paper in front of me. He was furious. He came, he said, then time, time up. He came up to me like this, and he went to grab it, and I said, hold it. And I took the 18 by 24 fucking rectangle, and I put George Lois in the corner. And I gave him that. You can't do a better design with a rectangle. <laughs> right? So what I had taught myself is, no matter what problem you get in life, no matter what job you get from, the, from, from Ed or anybody, no matter when you start working, no matter what they give you, come up with something that boggles, that, that, innovative, that boggles the mind, something that surprises. And I surprised the living shit out of him to the point where he didn't even understand what I did. And the next morning I said, oh my God, the next morning I walked in, there were 10 teachers who ran up to me and said, boy, what you did was brilliant. He obviously went to his locker and said, that George Lois, you know what, you know what he did? He gave me 18 by 24 rectangle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the point is, uh, what did I learn? Uh, uh, then I went at the Pratt, they, Pratt didn't teach me dick, dick shit. <laughs> I learned it all, I learned it all music and art. I taught myself all the music and art. I really, I swear to God they didn't. The only reason I stayed my second year is because I met a, this great looking Polish blonde. <laughs> and instead of going to classes, I used to pull her out of classes. I used to take her to Brooklyn Museum and, and show her, and she's a terrific artist today, by the way. Uh, so uh, I went into the second year, I said, why am I doing this? But I had this great teacher, Herschel Levitt, who saw me only a couple of weeks, and he said one day, he said, why are you in school? And I said, well, I want to get a job. I don't want to be a florist. He said, oh, is that what you want? <laughs> and he gave me the job, my first job. Boom, 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 boom. You know. um, so um, uh, that, what I did in high school, where I came up with an innovative answer to a, where I did, a, the, the, where I said, taught myself, whatever you do, come up, come, in fact, I was talking about this to a class at, uh, Steve Heller class, a terrific class, and, um, 
and I said to the class, you know, whatever the, the problem is, this, 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 including, if, if, including the number for a building, come up with an innovative. And three days later, I got a phone call from a real estate guy. He wants me to design a number for a building. You know, it was like looking up at God, like God saying, hey, asshole, prove it, you know. What's the name? What's the number? 20 times square. I said, holy shit. Then I did T, 2, O, beautiful colors, an X under it, and in a box, 20 times square. Yeah. The point is, every job you look at, how do I do it? How do I give a, have an innovative answer to it? How do I knock? How do I knock Ed on his ass when you show it? When you get a job, how do I knock my ass, boss on his ass? You, know, you should look at it and, and be, and, 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 and I'm talking about doing big ideas. And the idea of doing the rectangle is a big idea for a kid, you know what I mean? So that's what I learned, you know. Um, I, I gotta tell you, you, guys, you all have got to be incredibly lucky to, to work to be in a school with a guy like Ed, you know, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not just bullshitting, because he, 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 he worked at my, he, 